uh, wishing you a warm welcome to all of our colleagues who have returned for the second week of our virtual academic program on enhancing security and justice sector coordination to counter transnational organized crime. I hope that you have started to get to know each other uh, better already through your discussion groups from last week. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly. I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead for this program. I am also the moderator of our second plenary discussion here today, which will be about fostering national level interagency coordination to counter transnational organized crime. I am very pleased and honored to have on the virtual dais with me for this panel, retired Brigadier General Ace Peke from Botswana, Mrs. Biola Shotunde, Associate Director of the Financial Intelligence Unit of Nigeria, and Mr. Serene Asan Drame, a UNODC consultant on transnational organized crime, the Timbuk Institute team lead on transnational organized crime and migration, and a Senegalese magistrate. Um, so briefly, last week uh, in this program, we began looking at coordination through a cross-border angle. We took stock of the roles that regional, interregional, and bilateral coordination can play in countering transnational organized crime. And as you already know, um, these are very complex issues. There are a great deal of technical, legal, and strategic aspects to this kind of coordination. And so our distinguished speakers from last week, Mr. Martin Ewi from ISS Africa and Dr. Abdurrahman Diang from ECOWAS tried to distill some of the major issues in that domain for us. So just to give you a quick reminder of, of what we've already talked through, in terms of regional coordination, some of the most discussed coordination institutions last week were the West African Police Chiefs Committee and the Southern African Police Chiefs Cooperation Organization. Um, and these meet at least annually and they contrib contribute to SADC and ECOWAS policymaking on transnational organized crime. They can also, um, in line with what the regional economic communities decide to do, coordinate training related to strategies to counter crime. Um, and so these institutions interface with other decision making bodies within SADC and ECOWAS that formalize, formalize policies and plans that might harmonize member states approaches to countering drug trafficking, countering poaching, human trafficking, piracy, other forms of countering transnational organized crime. Um, so we talked about how harmonization of laws and coordination practices is itself very challenging on the regional level. We have different legal systems, different national languages involved, various political and diplomatic sensitivities of sharing information, and a great number of actors who are involved in these practices. So there is still in quite a few places an implementation gap between the legal frameworks, the international agreements, and regional strategies in place, um, of which there are many in the SADC and ECOWAS regions, versus the actual forms of coordination we end up seeing happening in real time. Um, but there are a variety of treaties, conventions, protocols, strategies, and political declarations related to transnational organized crime that SADC and ECOWAS are building upon. And the countries in these regions share an awareness that transnational organized crime needs to be dealt with through coordination because this is a threat or a challenge that's not limited by political borders. Um, you know, some of, I think, actions continue to be taken to move from a more fragmented regional approaches to those that are more comprehensively coordinated. Um, and more formalized coordination mechanisms can be useful for this, but so are informal networks and communication. And both of these things have also been key, not just to security sector coordination, but also to enhancing mutual legal assistance, extradition requests, and other parts of the work that different countries, prosecutors, and central authorities do on cases of mutual interest related to transnational organized crime. We also had speakers go over some of the interregional mechanisms of coordination that are happening all over the continent. So um, there were several examples of how ECOWAS and ECAS, uh, the Economic Community of Central African States, have been working. Um, one example was with the Gulf of Guinea Commission to set up an interregional coordination center for maritime security coordination. Um, 
you know, the, the, the center makes a presentation annually at the meeting of the heads of institutions of ECOWAS, ECAS, and the Gulf of Guinea. ECOWAS and ECAS also have a variety of other um, cooperation accords together, including a plan of action against trafficking in persons. Um, and we've seen in terms of SADC, they are in the process of drafting a regional framework to governize actions to counter transnational organized crime. And uh, that could influence how they move forward on their interregional efforts as well. Nearby, the Central African and East African Police Chiefs Coordination Committees have come together to coordinate on exchanging and sharing information on working more closely on handover requests for suspects of crime and helping each other in cross-border investigations. Um, I think another thing that was mentioned is that they're trying to standardize how to deal with people who are involved in cyber crime. And then finally, we cannot ignore uh, the bilateral aspect of cross-border coordination. This is an area that quite a few participants have focused on in the discussion group sessions, um, discussing and sharing information about. And coordination with neighboring states is, of course, a building block of getting to less fragmented regional approaches. Um, so this was a major element of last week's discussions, too. Um, there were quite a few insightful questions, some about region-specific trends in transnational organized crime that participants raised in the question and answer session. For further insight into some of those questions, I encourage you once again to visit the program website, to view the pre-program content, and to look at the syllabus and the recommended readings there. If you have not already, um, some of the recommended readings in the video speak to some of these trends that people were asking about related to where we see different kinds of crime occurring and where different kinds of criminal actors are most frequently working. And finally, there were furthermore some very insightful questions about how to include populations in developing relevant and effective state responses to transnational organized crime. And there were questions and comments about the difficulties of coordinating within country borders between army, police, gendarmes, intelligence, justice, the National Park Service, and other relevant ministries that might be involved in countering transnational organized crime. And to that, I will say, these issues will either be covered today or in the other two weeks to come in much greater depth. So I hope that those who ask those questions on these topics will intervene again to share their thoughts as we touch further on those issues. Now, getting to our business for today, uh, discussing the national level interagency elements of coordination, um, our goal here is to understand why that kind of coordination is important for countering transnational organized crime. We also have um, a variety people with a variety of backgrounds on our panel today. So we will hopefully be able to compare and contrast the different perspectives that defense and security, intelligence and justice actors have about the benefits and limits and challenges uh, and their advice on coordinating to counter transnational organized crime. So with that, I am very happy to welcome three very distinguished and accomplished panelists who will help us have an interesting exchange on these elements. You have their biographies in full on the website, so I will not go into too much detail, but let me do some brief introductions. First, Brigadier General Ace Peke holds a Bachelor of Science degree from University of Botswana, Lesotho and Swaziland, and a Master's degree in Public Administration from Auburn University in the USA. In the Botswana Defense Force, he served in various capacities, ranging from being an aircraft engineer to an assistant chief of staff of personnel. In addition, he served in the office of the president as a coordinator for the Botswana National Security Strategy Review 5 project from September 2007 to March 2011. In 2011, he joined the African Public Policy and Research Institute in Pretoria, South Africa, as a part-time consultant in charge of the security sector reform and governance program. Uh, welcome, General Peke. Mrs. Biola Shotunde is the Associate Director of Intelligence Investigation and CTR Analysis at the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit in Abuja. She has about 23 years cognate working experience across private and public sectors, respectively. She is a foundation staff of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission and the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit. 
The Nigerian FIU, Financial Intelligence Unit, is the central repository of all financial intelligence related to the combat of corruption, money laundering, terrorism, trafficking in persons, narcotics, and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction in Nigeria. So the NFIU has a statutory mandate to receive, analyze, and disseminate intelligence to all relevant stakeholders within the Nigerian national security system, comprising of all security, intelligence, and law enforcement community. Um, and it engages with other national financial intelligence units in a, 182 different countries. Mrs. Shotunde is a two-time recipient of the U.S. Department of Defense IMET Awards to National Defense University and the National Intelligence University in Washington, D.C., where she has earned several degrees and advanced certificates. Et uh, aussi, nous avons avec nous Monsieur Serene Hassan Drame. And we have Mr. Serene Hassan Drame. Um, he is a Senegalese judge. Uh, he has successfully held uh, the post of a judge, investigating judge, uh, presiding judge, and counselor to the appeal uh, court. He was general secretary of the National Institution on Human Rights in Senegal. Uh, the Senegalese Committee on Human Rights before joining uh, the United Nations Office Against Drugs and Crime and to be a counselor on legislative, legislative reform uh, in the project for the implementation of the regional action plan of ECOWAS against trafficking and uh, drug trafficking. Um, he helped several states to lead evaluations uh, within legislative frameworks um, in the fight against drug trafficking and organized crime. He's a specialist um, in human rights and he has worked on many uh, programs. He has worked on uh, human, uh, natural resources. He has taught in several universities in Senegal. And he has also led uh, the Department uh, Against Terrorism um, in several organizations as well. All right, with that, welcome to all of our panelists. Um, let's get into the discussion. I will first pose one question and um, ask each of you to respond. My first question for all of you is, to what extent is national level coordination between security, intelligence, and justice officials part of your country's efforts to counter transnational organized crime? And if so, has it been useful? Um, so we'll give each of you about six minutes to say a few words on this topic. Could I go first to General Peke, please? Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to share my thoughts on this topic. And to kick off, uh, uh, I would say, yes, there, there are some efforts in place and this really is work in progress, so to speak. Uh, the reason why I'm saying so is that perhaps it's not to the extent that one uh, may have wished for. And uh, the usefulness thereof uh, could be looked at as, in terms of the success rate, as still very low. Uh, I'll try and contextualize uh, what I mean by this. Uh, in the region, uh, SADC uh, came up with the law enforcement and anti-poaching strategy of 2015 to 2016. Now, that is a guide for uh, SADC uh, member states to use in terms of their uh, anti-poaching approaches or wildlife uh, illegal trade uh, in general. <clears throat> so in Botswana, uh, the stakeholders who are the agencies uh, tasked with uh, dealing with poaching and illegal wildlife trade 
Uh, recently, as far back as perhaps two years back, uh, set up a stakeholder uh, coordination committee, which is called Botswana National Anti-Poaching Coordination Committee, uh, made up of uh, representatives from the various uh, agencies. <clears throat> and this committee meets once every week. And what they do is to consolidate reports from operational areas of all the stakeholders. And then uh, having analyzed these reports, they will then advise their respective uh, heads of agencies who in turn would consolidate their reports and submit a brief cabinet. And then uh, mitigating measures can then be taken based on those reports. <clears throat> There is also between the security heads and the magistrates at magistrate level, what is called a justice forum. Now, ideally the justice forum is to try and bring into the fore what the justice sector is doing in terms of trying to address the illegal wildlife trade and poaching uh, cases. <clears throat> because by far and large it has been noted that uh, that is one of the very challenging areas when it comes to prosecutions and convictions of these cases. And in actual fact, even the, the, the nature of the crimes are not perhaps deemed as serious crimes according to law. So that is one of the very challenging areas. <clears throat> uh, they also meet, I think, quarterly uh, to try and address, uh, address those issues. The other attempt is for joint operations among stakeholders, although these are mainly in the form of stove-piped operations. Uh, that is, you don't get them mixed up for an operation. They may go to a problem area in as independent entities and uh, try and uh, address the issues at hand. <clears throat> now, let me contextualize this a little bit further by way of background. <clears throat> the other day I was looking at the OC index for Africa for Botswana. And I noted that the criminal market score is at 3.34, roughly there about. But this is comprising wildlife crime ranking at about 70%, seven out of 10. And then the others would take off the balance. Now that in itself is telling. Uh, you'd also want to appreciate that 40% of Botswana's land mass uh, comprises wildlife parks, game reserves, and wildlife management areas. Now, if we task that massive area to a small agency, relatively small agency of the Department of Wildlife and National Parks, then it is indeed an insurmountable task for it to carry out its mandate to its rightful conclusion. And therefore, this is why there is this attempt to bring in all the security uh, actors and the justice together to try and uh, bridge that uh, gap. The criminal actors uh, also, according to the OC index, uh, comprises of foreign actors and criminal networks at about 50% each and a little bit at 30% of state embedded actors. So it is not far-fetched to suggest or argue that fauna crimes are high because of the increased and sophisticated nature of poaching and the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, and contrast that against an ill-resourced lead agency, uh, which lacks a uh, concrete coordination in its own. And therefore this call to have other agencies come in to assist. 
Now, who are these, lead, uh, these stakeholders that I'm talking about? One, the lead agency is the Department of Wildlife and National Parks. Uh, ordinarily, this is a technically uh, based uh, department because in their nature of duties, uh, they have to appreciate and understand animal behavior, morphology, uh, anatomy and physiology of animals so that they may be better placed to uh, roll out their mandate and execute it accordingly. So they are charged with the protection and, con uh, and conservation of wildlife and therefore also to prevent uh, any criminality. <clears throat> we also have the police. Now the police in their uh, police act are duly enforced to, to, sorry, they are duly uh, placed to enforce all written laws with which uh, they are directly charged. And amongst these also laws relating to wildlife crimes. <clears throat> we also have the military who we know really are there to save their territorial integrity. And by their nature, they manage and use force and they also aid civil authority. <clears throat> we have the intelligence as well, who are charged with information gathering. They analyze the information and then furnish others with the, all the requisite intelligence. Uh, we also have the justice in like the courts, for example, and they have to meet out uh, convictions based on the prosecution uh, that uh, comes to their tables. And perhaps to a limited extent, uh, we also have the financial uh, authority, which really deals with proceeds of crimes. So these, in a nutshell, are all the stakeholders, uh, perhaps a few more that I haven't mentioned, but uh, we'd expect coordination to be amongst all these. <clears throat> But there are challenges, and the challenges arise out of the different mandates and roles for each of these uh, uh, stakeholders. You know, they have different doctrines, different training, and perhaps to a large extent, diverse resource allocation in terms of human capital and material uh, resources. Now, if we come to evidence and collection of uh, for for these criminal uh, activities, that seems to be where the major problem is, because we have these siloed formations of all these stakeholders who go out to these problem areas for patrols and try and execute their mandates accordingly. <clears throat> But some of them really are not trained to gather evidence of that nature. You can imagine if that is left for the uh, military alone, then it means when uh, the prosecution prepare their cases, there is bound to be some limiting factors. And so invariably we find that even the police don't do that much as well and they tend to end up just charging uh, the criminals for uh, unlawful possession, be it of arms or of trophies, because there was not sufficient evidence uh, led. And also technology plays a part in this regard, because uh, in this time and age, one would have thought that there would be a uh, DNA gadgets in place so as to conserve the evidence for further uh, review for prosecution. But that yeah, doesn't yeah. seem to take place uh, as one would have thought. And then the delays due to the case management uh, 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 with, the, with the magistrates, the delays pose a serious problem wherein you'll find eventually when the case comes into the roll call, perhaps all that evidence is lost or destroyed, or even the witnesses themselves may have passed on 
or they have moved to other areas. And therefore, it is a very challenging uh, place to uh, try and address. General Take. But we, yeah, I think can I, I have 10 seconds. I think you do, yeah. We'll come back to you for another round. You, I, obviously, yes, there's a, yes. lot, a lot everyone has to say, but yeah. To wrap yes, up. Uh, I'm just uh, I'm just rounding off this one. Okay. Yeah. So what we find here is there is a lot of leg room to work uh, around, and we need to really push so that we can try and work towards a properly uh, defined strategy for counter uh, to counter these uh, threats. And so I think with that, I'll stop and we'll continue in the next question. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, right. thank you for um, starting us off with a great summary of um, some of the key challenges. Um, let's build on that. Let me move to Biola, Mrs. Shotunde. Could you give us your answer to this question about um, what kind of a national level interagency coordination is happening in Nigeria and has it been useful so far? Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited for this uh, very important uh, uh, workshop. Um, I want to answer this question by saying that to a very large extent, that's the way uh, the current uh, government in Nigeria has uh, started approaching the various uh, challenges we have. Uh, in terms of trans-organized crime, uh, we have them in different shades and became a very serious national issue for us as a country. So this approach has led this country to engage. Uh, we have what we call the civilian JTF. We have what we call the uh, Joint Intelligence Board. And then we recently, through the help and coordination of the FIU, Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I saw that you were not responding, so that's why I, yeah. So let me recap, let me pull back a little. So Nigeria has, uh, to a large extent, decided to go the approach of uh, having a nationwide uh, engagement with all the stakeholders. And this has been very uh, helpful. Uh, the fact is that we have a lot of national problems that relates to trans-organized crime. Uh, like the drug issues, the wildlife, illegal wildlife trade, and uh, the terrorism itself that we have, which is a big issue. So the way we try to use this approach is to work together as uh, a collective team. Uh, we, so we have now a, a situation where we have the military talking to all the other sister agencies especially the FIU, they've put the FIU to very good use in recent time. They take a lot of intelligence from us and uh, they've been able to use that for their various operations. And uh, we, have the, uh, we have what they call the co collaboration with the civilian population, which is called the civilian JTA. That's uh, John Ta Joint Tax Force uh, that help to provide local intelligence and uh, helping them to navigate the difficult terrain where this crime really exists. We also have what we now recently called Operation Service White. And I'll quickly give a background to how we get there. Uh, we had this very serious problem of uh, kidnapping and ransom uh, taking from people. And uh, the crime pattern indicates that we have foreigners from other countries also merging and working with our local foreigners to perpetrate this crime. So the, we did a kidnapping uh, uh, intelligence product for the presidency. And uh, afterward, that product was very useful to help them curb this uh, criminal network. And it revealed a lot of um, uh, issues behind the drivers of this uh, criminal network. And that went a long way to help us to now navigate towards what we call Operation Service-wide. 
it's never existed, but it's just something that came out of good collaboration and good networking and use of uh, all the various uh, institutions mandate put together. So we've also been able to assist with uh, timely intelligence uh, to, the, to the population that we serve. So we, and on a daily basis, our stakeholders network keep increasing because there is uh, a lot of confidence and demand for the services we have, especially at the FIU, because we're very unique in terms of the type of information we have. Go ahead, you wanna say something? So to, to a very large extent, this, uh, the utilization of um, the na national level coordination of uh, engagement and collaboration has been very useful. Uh, I will cite a case that we have ongoing, I think two or three. Uh, the first one is the issue of the seizure at the port for the illicit wildlife at uh, Lagos port. So the customs I had to uh, talk to us and uh, we, we also have to go to work very quickly and uh, respond to that uh, uh, incident. And we're providing them with uh, very strong uh, and credible intelligence that will help through the investigation phase. And uh, we find about six national agencies and uh, we, yeah, so yesterday we had meetings with the US embassy team that visited uh, talking about how they could also be supportive and uh, how they could provide uh, information and intelligence on this uh, case. So the, the, we've used this network and this approach to network both nationally and internationally. And uh, it's been very helpful because uh, we have our foreign stakeholders coming more to us. The UNODC is uh, making more reference they, because we now have uh, a lot of uh, sector specific crime uh, analysis uh, team. And this has also changed our dynamics on how we respond to the various crime. Last year, I'll mention this, uh, we were able to have the first conviction for, the, for piracy crime. And there was conviction and these people were sent to jail. So that's something that has never happened in our history. And we know how turbulent our Gulf of Guinea and the crime that has been going on there. Thanks to the specialized uh, team that do the analysis and provide this timely intelligence. So this has gone a long way to help the interagency collaboration and it's been yielding good results. And uh, a lot of our stakeholders uh, keep uh, looking for our products and services. So on the intelligence angle, I think intelligence is very critical to all the operations of the other colleagues out there doing the main work. And for the justice, we also make sure that when they are doing the prosecution, they, they reach out to us through the office of the attorney general. And uh, we have very good engagement with them and we give them uh, good support in terms of uh, intelligence that will support the uh, prosecution process. So this has been very uh, helpful. It's, uh, it's, it's yielding good results. You know, when you have too much of too many problems, it looks like you're not moving anywhere. But I think from my experience, uh, there's hope and uh, we, it will only keep getting better. Yeah, I don't know if I still have more time. Uh, I can quickly talk about the national focal point for uh, terrorism. I was able to coordinate that at a national level. I think we had about 47 interagency group network up to the postal services into this uh, group and uh, everyone had a role to play. And uh, they, were, they had the mandate to, it was an AU mandate that the focal point was implementing to to get the country prepared and ready to respond to the concerns of terrorism. And uh, that group has been in existence and cu currently it's been anchored by the National Security Advisor. And uh, the group has been has transformed into 
uh, a much more effective uh, 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 network. And they've provide they've they've documented the national strategy on how to respond to uh, the terrorism. To be very precise, so this has been the way uh, co collaboration at the national level has been. It's been very helpful. It's uh, it's been rewarding. Recently, again, we had seizures of uh, drugs at the port. With the end, the drug agency had already reached out to us, and we have also reached out to them, and we are already in good contact and in good discussion on how to support uh, their intervention. So this has been very helpful. I keep it uh, simple here, and I wait for further questions and interaction. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Mrs. Shotunde. Thank you for giving us um, a, a quick but very detailed sketch, um, just as General Peke had for his country. So um, some interesting elements here, some interesting overlaps. Um, let's move to our third panelist, uh, Mr. Drame Hassan. Um, could we turn to you on this question now? Um, what, what kind of national level coordination is happening in your country, Senegal? to counter crime and, and to what extent has it been useful so far? Thank you so much. Thank you. I am very happy to have the opportunity to share my experiences uh, with you in terms of uh, fighting crime. I, I was very fortunate as you mentioned, to um, to to work uh, throughout West Africa and Central Africa uh, to uh, in the fight against crime. We when we look at the justice uh, framework, there there are some important things to note in the fight against transnational crime. First, there's the importance of coordination and cooperation uh, in within the Justice Department and nationally and internationally. We have noted that, uh, that crime, transnational crime is very flexible, very adaptable. So, it, it touches upon many sectors of the country. So it is very important to um, have the coordination of different agencies. So in terms of strategies at the national level, it's important that the states have a very good coordinating organization to, to um, fight crime. In terms of the fight against terrorism, we have interministerial coordination that manages the strategies for this. And we know that terrorism is, it's very difficult to discern and fight it. We have to create. Um, we have to create an ensemble to fight this. And um, in terms of the strategy, it's so important to focus on 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 the how. It's very important to to predict things and not just be in a position of reacting to situation. It's important to have the proper intelligence that so we can identify the dangers, we can profile people, and we can, uh, you know, discern the modus operandi of groups. And all of this, um, you know, it's important not to just be in a reactive position. And there have been good results, but this um, uh, we, we, we ana analyze the results and and also 
at the same time, we must think uh, think of uh, of amending uh, legislation to uh, fight the terrorism issues. It would be interesting to think upon the strategies that we are employing on the national level. I think we're going to come back a moment to to the pr processes. If we look at the criminal procedures, we have to do this to fight crime. Some countries have made the choice to militarize uh, this issue, but I think it's important to, to use the justice system to approach the problems of crime because crime today it's economic it's environmental it's many on many levels and as mentioned earlier the the objective of course is uh, financial gain uh, from these criminals so we need to make sure that we can um, have convictions we can convict these criminals and, and destabilize these uh, criminal networks. We have to um, we have to dismantle these uh, networks so they no longer have a means. And if we can uh, interrupt their financial flow, uh, they they are using it. That that is the key because they're using very sophisticated uh, means to engage in crime. So it's important to uh, focus on the judicial response. So currently in West Africa, as in, the, uh, in the what we call the civil law, there are two important aspects. There's the um, prosecutors and the uh, investigative judge. And so they are responsible mainly in uh, fighting crime. And but what the prosecuting attorneys must use all, all the means that are available to them um, and uh, to follow the conventions that have been ratified by their country and other neighboring countries of the region. Now, at the level of coordination, what is important is to have unified action. So when there is the judge, the judge is going to is going to be the, the impulsive driver of the judicial procedures processes. So the judge is going to need the, the gendarmerie, it's going to need other auxiliary aspects of the judicial system to, to it's going to need the services of telecommunications to have wiretapping, they can use that, etc. So all of the actors that I have mentioned, there is the judge is the central central figure that is going to be the driver uh, and he's able to requisition um, actions and he will need uh, forensic information, forensic data, scientific da data to have elements that will um, lead to convictions. So this is the role of the judge. So it's important that the judge uh, have the skills and knowledge to, to, to use all of these uh, options. So when I speak of, uh, of the auxiliary services like the gendarmerie, there are, we, as we have noted, uh, crime is, is multi-faceted. Uh, there's the, the illegal uh, forestry um, the logging, there are 
problems on the borders. So we need to be able to ensure that the the um, customs are working with us also for, to stop the the traffic of many things such as drugs. But the difficulty that we have each 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 uh, municipality, each region has their own database, and so we need to have a system that will allow us to the, the judge must be able to have access to all the databases and this will greatly uh, enhance results he must have this but otherwise we are spinning our wheels uh, because time is on the side of the criminals and they uh, manage to escape the processes and, and slip through through the cracks and so we have we have think tanks to work on these issues how can we best use all the tools that we have at our disposal to fight the crime there must be a permanent dialogue between the judge and the other um, actors in the justice system i work in a region uh, on the borders i worked on the region between uh, two countries senegal and and guinea bissau and we had uh, good results because there was a constant dialogue, a continuing dialogue. I was the uh, investigative judge and I, we were able to, we were, if we were able to work together to see, sometimes we would let some uh, trafficking uh, go across the borders to see where it would end up to follow the trail, in other words. But you have to have the judge implicated in, in, the, in the entire uh, process. The judge has to be the partner with all other entities because it's, it's, it's so important to, to have the judge uh, follow the entire, the entire pathway of the crimes and the response to it. We have, we have many resources that are underutilized actually. And so here are a few elements that I wanted to share with you. If you have other questions, I'd be glad to answer. Excellent. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Dramé. Aussi pour avoir uh, souligné. Uh, Thank you so very much, Mr. Dramé, especially for having discussed the importance of the investigative judges, what there is, uh, how other actors are involved with whom you must work to fight crime. And you are thinking both on the strategic and operational levels as a judge, as a magistrate. I think we will go to a second question. We'll do a second round. Um, uh, I think um, to leave time for question and answer will have to be, um, it'll have to be shorter, um, unfortunately. But let me ask one follow-up question to everybody on our panel. Um, so. We know that there are a variety of different kinds of coordination that could be happening, as you've outlined. There are also some horizontal elements. So we have um, equally ranked leaders in different agencies and ministries who may need to coordinate. There's also the question of vertical coordination, making different actors within a hierarchy, whether it's judicial or intelligence related or military work together to counter organized crime. You've talked about other interagency elements of coordination. So. In terms of advice for our participants, what, um, what is your advice to your colleagues um, who may be trying to use some of these methods we've talked about um, for improving coordination to counter various forms of organized crime? Um, what can you tell us from your experience um, if you have one piece of advice maybe for colleagues who will try to work on this issue um, given all of the challenges, what would you say? So let me spend, um, let me ask you to spend maybe five minutes maximum um, and I'll go around the table again. General Peke, Peke, could we hear from you first? Thank you once again, Ted. 
Uh, I mentioned earlier on that there is a national uh, coordinating committee for anti-poaching uh, purposes uh, derived from all the stakeholders in the country. Uh, to try and reach that uh, solution for both horizontal and vertical coordination, uh, the measures that are being worked on is such that uh, this committee uh, has their uh, members, not necessarily at rank level, but uh, at office level for the job in question. So they have an equivalent of what we call a joint operations center. The committee itself is a joint operations center. So that is at headquarter level. And then underneath it, they have a forward operating basis. Now these are out in the districts or in the problem areas for coaching. And they will have a officers of, from all these stakeholders responsible for the day-to-day -day, uh, operations. And then they would report to the headquarter level at the Joint Operations Center. But still at the district level uh, at operational areas, we have what are called uh, diffusion centers. Uh, these are intelligence cells uh, which work to gather information, then analyze it, and then report the intelligence accordingly, that is to the operation basis and subsequently to headquarter level. So in a nutshell, that is what obtains now. And this is as informed by, remember I mentioned the law enforcement and anti-coaching strategy of the region. They have picked up points that they think they can work on so that consequently they will then uh, develop the Botswana National Anti-Poaching Strategy. <clears throat> but there is a, a catch here in that uh, there is a big gap between the SADC uh, Anti-Poaching Strategy and what this committee is doing. And that gap is the Botswana National uh, security strategy, because one would have thought that this committee, when it works on the anti-poaching strategy, it would have been informed by the national security strategy to the extent that the, that strategy would go deeper to address the political economy issues, uh, given the competing needs of all the various institutions in, in government. And so that is one element that I think needs to be driven harder so that they can confidently say, yes, we have our mandate drawn from the national security strategy. So that is work in progress. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned that the success rates are very low. I think again, it is because of that lack of coordinated uh, work between the magistrates, the justice, and this body, that are, uh, the coordinating committee. So again, through the justice forum at the lateral level, uh, they will be able to reach their intended goals. I think uh, in brief, that is uh, how the lateral and vertical coordination mechanisms are addressed. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, General Peke. Um, great, so a couple of takeaways, but I think one big piece of your advice, it seems, is about um, national security strategy and how broader strategy should be informing how we're approaching some of these challenging issues. Um, let me move to Mrs. Shotunde. Viola, could you give us um, a, a piece of advice that you might have from your experience on approaching coordination, please? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest advice is uh, to say that uh, institutions must collaborate. That's the key word, uh, collaboration across mandates. Uh, we all have various mandates. We have our limits. So the, the big issue is the main objective of keeping the country or the environment safe and getting rid of those criminal networks. If the criminal networks are uh, 
corporates and they achieve their crime and they move from country to country. Uh, I've seen situation where people uh, stole in the Asian countries and they move into Nigeria, they're doing big business, they, they're very well established, they're big names locally. And so this can only happen through cooperation. So when you have criminals cooperating across the borders uh, and the national, uh, national respondents would not work together, it's, uh, it's a disaster. So there is nothing else that we can say here than to say that uh, cooperation is the key. Engagement is also very critical. You need to talk to each other. You need to know each other's mandate. And uh, you need to also know the role and the importance of the critical layers of people. Uh, for us, we have uh, what we call the uh, interministerial committee. That's pretty much strategic where we have the policy level making people come together around the table and discuss issues at the strategic uh, level for a quick fix and for good briefing. So they get to know what the problems are, they scope the problems and they're able to respond to these problems at that level it's because they are at the strategic level. And then we have what we call the authorized officers forum where you have uh, officers that are given the mandate to represent their various agencies around the table to bring up their concerns and their issues. And these are also promptly dealt with. It is out the bureaucracy of communication and the uh, process within interagency cooperation. So this has been very effective and it will only keep, it will get better uh, my advice is that we should also see how we incorporate the, the private sector. Africa has not leveraged the, the utilization of the critical information that is available with uh, the private sector operators, uh, both the financial and the non-financial. We move into the era of technology where the whole world has come to be a global village just like we're doing right now. Otherwise we'll meet at the point and interact physically, but now we're so digital by everything that, <laughs> so we need to talk to the people that provide this te technology that supports how our life is being shaped. There's a lot of information that we can get from them. They are also very critical stakeholders that need to be brought into the frame of affairs of how we respond to trans organized crime. So I'll keep it simple by saying that short of engaging and talking to each other and being willing to help each other, I, I don't see how we can achieve uh, success and victory in this uh, course. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, it seems like um, quite a few pieces of, of advice um, in there in your response. Um, some highlights um, that I've noticed here, um, knowing each other's mandates and why they're important, communicating and getting to know one another formally and informally, um, leveraging the private sector and figuring out how to do even better because criminals are collaborating all the time. So we need to be able to do the same within our um, bureaucracies and within our structures. Um, great. Uh, well, let me turn now to Mr. Drame Asan. Uh, could you um, give us um, maybe five minutes of your thoughts on this? Do you have advice um, about how to approach coordination, whether it's horizontal, vertical, or otherwise? Ah, voilà, bon. there you go. Bon. Okay. Donc, abordez... Right. So to talk about this issue from a horizontal or vertical standpoint, uh, we have to go back to what I said earlier. Uh, horizontally, we're talking about cooperation, a, a cooperation framework, uh, like what we have in, in Senegal, uh, in our network. It's so the TOC is so great these days that it's so large that we have to set up 
a, a, a cooperation that's going to take into account all the ministries because you know you have the, the ministry of environment uh, ministry of econ the economy the ministry of justice they're all, all affected by this so all ministries are concerned um, by uh, these TOCs. So if we're able to set up a framework, uh, a, a central body that is set up with a mission and that can guide the efforts, and this will enable um, those in charge <clears throat> of the various actions against criminal organizations. They're going to be able to gather together, discuss of, uh, discuss cases, discuss new laws, discuss what we need. And we really need to emphasize the, this proactivity regarding information uh, because we have to be organized because these are our uh, organizations that have an excellent structure and they're often well ahead of us uh, they use technology and they don't have borders they don't respect borders so we have to adapt and today uh, it, it cannot be in isolation, be it the gendarmerie, justice, etc. We cannot fight on our own. We, 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 it's only a, within the framework of an establishment of a synergy of our skills that we can even hope to fight against this, uh, given the, the, the extent of, of the uh, TOC. So we really have to have a strategic thought process to look at this. Now, from the vertical standpoint, I, I talked about it earlier, we have to have proper coordination. Judges need to talk to uh, vary the various actors in the um, legal framework. Um, but it has to go beyond that because we know that TOC has an impact on, on the entire chain. So it's, so it's not just a question of, of working with the gendarmerie and the police, but you actually have to broaden um, this. You have to look at financial information, you know, contacting banks to be able to track the, the transactions that are taking place because very often we see arrests being made in, in countries. A, a big, um, you know, you, you have a big operation where they arrest some people, but in reality, will it dismantle the network? So we need to keep in mind that our objective is not to arrest one or two individuals or to arrest uh, you know, to find uh, some forbidden substances, but we really want to dismantle the networks. And this is a long-term task. Every actor, every player needs to play his role. Because if we don't have a permanent structure, if we don't have a decision-making center that can coordinate everything that is being done, it, it, we're not going to succeed. And I'm in an area where at times uh, the gendarmerie, the, the military would intervene uh, and they might, they might find uh, criminals from, from organizations that they arrested, but sometimes the, the level of coordination w was so lacking that they couldn't go back up the chain. Uh, so other suspects could just uh, get rid of any evidence and you weren't able to convict anyone because you, you didn't have that coordination. So the, the result uh, of the trial was not good. So this is really, uh, and the judge must have the, the amount of leadership that is needed to push things forward, but you have to have a, a permanent coordination. So it, it's not a question of taking care of one individual. You have to have a broad approach. Like you need to ask, so, you know, you have to talk to the police 
or the gendarmerie or the military that is in the field. You have to ask them what they think. Uh, and, and that could actually help the judge uh, in, in conducting the, this, this trial. But they, they really have to share a strategy. And another important item is, and, and a very important example for me, and, and Côte d'Ivoire uh, was a great example. They set up a, a unit fighting organized crime and it uh, brings together uh, police, gendarmerie, financial people, et cetera. So it really, it's an organization with uh, multiple um, members and it has an operational element. So it, it, it looks at strategy and, and brings it to the operational effect. So if you have this strategic element and you have this operational um, facet, then and you bring them together, you can have success. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Drame. Um, thank you for that. Um, yes, it seems like some other pieces of advice or some other food for thought that came out here. Um, we need institutions, um, interministerial institutions that allow for more communication. Um, the idea that the criminal justice and prison system um, uh, aspects of that need to be integrated into how we're coordinating and strategically thinking about things. Judges, even though they're not on the ground, they're not uh, sur le terrain, they're not on the ground, there needs to be a permanent dialogue um, between the judge and maybe the judicial police officers or the gendarmes or the uh, military folks who are on the ground um, experiencing um, and talking to um, and dealing with suspects of transnational organized crime. And then this interesting example of a particular special unit that was set up in Ivory Coast. We know that in a couple of other countries, there are some special units like this that bring together people from different sectors to try to improve this sort of strategic coordination. So that's great. Thank you so much. Um, well, wonderful. Um, thank you to our fabulous trio of speakers for their insights from their work as military intelligence and judicial officials involved in interagency coordination.